Audit Risk and Scrutiny Committee. I think it's our second meeting. Uh, just gone half past ten on my uh, my phone, but ten thirty according to this uh, instruments we have in front of us. First thing I will cover is I would like to remind everyone present that this meeting will be recorded and that the recording will be subsequently uh, be available for public listening if required, usually through YouTube. I think that's the case. Uh, first item on the, the agenda is said and apologies. Claire, is that yourself that will cover that? Yes, that's myself. Thank you, Chair. There's nine members present this morning. Two apologies being Councillor Gilroy and Councillor Karen Carruthers. Thank you. Thanks so much for that. Any declarations of interest for anyone? These people are all very interested in this agenda day. That's none. Minute of the meeting, 23rd. Can we agree that, that that's a true reflection of what took place on the 23rd? Okay, we've got no descendants from that, uh, so we'll, we'll see that has been agreed. And item number four, uh, fortunate, fortunate enough to meet Grant Thornton, not the team, but certainly, Joanne, if you can come up, Joanne, if that's okay, on Monday through the Integrated Joint Board. And what I'm going to ask to do in regards to this, this is Joanne's report, really, and as far as the, the appendix is, is concerned, is just to set the scene. You see a bit of background, any points she wants to pick up in particular round about this, and then... Uh, We'll take it to the committee after that. So over to you, Joanne. Oh, sorry, I should say, just before you do it, we've got Joanne, we've got uh, Chloe, and we've got Rich in the background. Is that right? Just as Grant Thornton's team. Sorry, I should have said that earlier. Over to, to you, Joanne. Thank you very much. So this is our final report following the audit of the financial statements, which follows on from the audit plan we presented to the equivalent committee of this back in March. If I could just confirm that we are independent of the Council. We haven't had any non-audit fees during the year and we, and we have reflected that in our report. And the fee we've set out remains unchanged from what we set out in our plan. Um, I'd just like to quickly talk through some of the key points, myself and Chloe. Chloe will touch on the financial statements audit and I'll just explain a wee bit more about the wider scope reporting. Thanks. So um, if you turn to page 13 of the pack, We've got our detailed key messages from the account. Firstly, we've issued an uh, unqualified opinion, which means we give a true and fair view of the financial statements. Um, we're also required to report there is an other matter in our audit opinion, which relates to the roads maintenance service, which didn't meet the three-year requirement to break even over three years. Um, our materiality is set based on gross expenditure detailed on page 12, um, and that's the basis we use to assess and develop a testing strategy, um, which is risk-based. Um, the risks we plan at the audit are detailed on page 16, and we haven't changed those since we brought our audit plan to committee in February. Um, and finally, I'd like to just draw attention to the page 18 of the pack, which details the judgments and estimates. Um, these are areas we've particularly focused on throughout the course of the audit um, and bring a certain amount more risk. Um, but we're satisfied with those and we have no significant issues to raise there. Um, and finally, I'd just like to say thank you very much to Karen and the rest of the officers that supported us during the audit to help us deliver the audit. Thanks. And then if I can just touch on the, the remainder of our report, under our auditing responsibilities under the Code of Audit Practice, we're required to consider the Council's arrangements across a number of areas um, in terms of wider scope dimensions. So what you'll see in the report is we've commented on specific things around governance and transparency, financial management and financial sustainability, particularly looking at some of the Council's financial plans going forward, recognising the financial challenges ahead, as well as how the Council continues to demonstrate value for money and best value. The section, the Accounts Commission Strategic Priorities, they are priorities that the Accounts Commission have set for local government. They may change year on year, whereas the rest of the dimensions won't change. But that's very much around council plan and how councils set the strategic direction of the council. How do they engage with citizens and measure the impact the council's having in terms of performance and delivering services? This is effectively our first year working with the council. So for us, it was very much getting up to speed with the council's arrangements and key activities of the council. There is quite a lot of narrative in the report and we have identified some areas where we think the Council can further consider and take action and there is an action plan in the report. I won't go through all the detail in the wider scope section but I'm happy to pick up questions and equally Chloe is happy to pick up questions on the audit itself. 
Thanks very much, Joanne, for that. Okay, I'll open it up to members. Any particular questions? Who wants to start? Graham? <coughs> yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, many thanks for your, your short presentation there. Looking at page 12, obviously, the, 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 the audit uh, plan and uh, final fee was £317,000. Uh, 317,190 uh, 317, pounds. Um, is this fixed for a couple of years? Uh, what was it compared to the previous? Was it, I believe it, the chair was around about 292. Has there been an increase there? I don't know about Joanne. Um, I, I think in terms of year on year, I don't think there has necessarily been a cre an increase. Um, our fees are set in accordance with Audit Scotland guidance, um, we can then vary the fee from what Audit Scotland set up to 10% and we haven't varied the fee at all this year. That 317,000 consists of a number of elements. So 190,000 of that is related to the external audit and the wider scope audit, which is effectively my, my responsibility. Uh, also included in that fee is Audit Scotland's pooled costs, contribution to over Audit Scotland overheads, and also a contribution to the performance audit and best value programme, which is about 100,000 of the fee. So that takes into account all Audit Scotland's reporting around local government overview and specific reporting around, like, equal pay, the most recent reports included within that, that fee allocation. Sorry, there's, a, there's two parts questions. So we're looking at another one here on page 96. It's on the balance sheet. Um, Obviously, looking at 31st of March 2016, you have 174,847,000 net assets and liabilities. Getting back to 31st of March this year, you're down to 18,050,000. I've got concerns about that, obviously. Is how do you manage to wipe 150 million off your assets? Uh, looking at 18, 18 million, that's another DG1 there, isn't it? So I've got concerns about that. I mean, my family are from Charter of Accountancy background, and I certainly wouldn't like to have books like this. If I just provide some comment, and then I'll pass it to Karen in terms of the actual financial statements themselves. There's a number of accounting adjustments that go through these financial statements, and year on year, particularly around the pension liabilities, you will see fluctuations in those numbers and the accounting of that, and that effectively moves your balance sheet quite substantially, but what you still have is effectively reserves that you had, which are consistent with prior year in terms of how you've got usable reserves. But Karen can talk more about the, the accounting detail if that would be helpful. As I said, um, like our pension valuations do come from like external actuaries and they can um, significantly shift year on year um, depending on the sort of assumptions that they, they take and the changes in market conditions and things they said, but it does then impact on our unusable reserves. So it's basically like a revaluation reserve of our pension adjustments. But I mean, if you looked at the balance sheet, excluding the pension line, which is just in your, the bottom line of your long term liabilities, you will actually see that our net, net assets have increased in year if you excluded the pension fund adjustment. Chair, maybe come back in again. Obviously, looking at the property, plant, and equipment, and, and he heritage assets and assets for, that the council actually have, some of these can be actually overvalued. You know, it's like valuing a house. You know, you got 10 to 15 percent leeway in a valuation of the house. Land valuations, the district valuer, because I know a bit about land valuation, and and, and um, I'm I'm maybe concerned that some of these uh, assets are overvalued, and you're actually maybe I've got concerns about that. How often are these assets valued by Dumfries and Galloway Council? Because you know you actually could be overinflating the the, the, the assets on this balance sheet here. I said, like all our assets are valued on a five-year rolling cycle, so everything will be done at least once every five years. And then, if there's reason to believe that there is there has been a change in valuation, that would be brought forward and done sooner. Like for instance, like some of like if there had been like defects identified, it would be revalued at that point to make sure we've got a, a like sort of reliable valuation in the account. Chair, certainly the private sector so valuations will be changed uh, but more often than that. I can assure you that, Chair. Malcolm. Uh, thank you, Chair. I was just looking at the huge rise in the in the uh, pension liability, which is actually fifty percent basically year on year. Um, basically, if we have another. 
50% rise uh, will probably be uh, technically insolvent. Um, is this something that should be set an alarm bells ringing with the pension fund? The the liability that's shown in, in the balance sheet there, the, the four hundred and sixty million, uh, that's based on an annual valuation which is required for the the accounts. Those valuations which are produced by the actuary use a very prudent investment return figure based on government gilts. Uh, members will be aware that interest rates are extremely low, so the gilt price is basically next to nothing, and that impacts on the value of the liabilities. Uh, the pension fund accounts which are coming up later on show the actual position as at the 31st of March with, uh, with regard to the assets of the fund. The fund itself is undergoing a triannual evaluation at the present moment in time, uh, and with the, the liabilities there are valued on a, a more realistic uh, figure that takes account of investment returns, etc. So the, the liabilities which will appear in the, the pension fund accounts are substantially less than what appear in the, the council's accounts, if that makes sense. I suppose going back to Malcolm's point, is it is it, would it should it be raising alarm bells for us, Andrew? I think that's the, probably the point that I've picked up on more than anything. Raising alarm bells because of the size of the figure, yes, but it's one it, it's an accounting issue. It, it's not an actual. Uh, we don't have to put those sums aside. The, the actual pension fund itself, when it's valued, the contributions, which are determined through the, the triennial valuation take account of any deficits in the fund to ensure that the fund's ongoing and sustainable. Okay, thank you. Any secondary questions regards to that, Malcolm? Yep. Uh, it's just if you're, if you're saying you've got, we've got two, basically in effect, two means of valuing the pension fund, uh, which one's the true and fair view? I would say that the, the, the actual trial and evaluation, which is for the pension fund itself is the true value. Uh, what's appearing in the council's accounts, the, the, the annual the IAS 19 report, which is based on these very, we say, very prudent and got uh, set by government, the valuation for that, based on gilt yields alone, makes the assumption that the pension fund only invests in gilts, whereas it actually invests in a wide, a wide range of uh, investments which produce a better performance, better returns over the long term than the gilts would. So the pension fund itself, the liabilities there are, are, are stated are, are much less, but take account of what the pension fund is actually invested in. The, the, the council's accounts only look at the membership of the fund and how that would be funded based on a gilts only basis. Thank you. Graham, is it on the same point? I've got a just quick one on, on Graham's first, uh, Graham Bell's first question, and just going back to that secondary, in regards to the fees, I think what you've said, Joanna, is, did I pick you up right, but 100k of that goes to Grant Thornton, and the rest is divided up into others. Okay, just, uh, I'm just trying, when I first seen that, I compared it to obviously the pension fund, and there's 24k charged for that as a remarkable level of difference, so I thought, what does the council actually get for that, in, in regards to, so I wonder if there's anything you can add in regards to that, and, Training vote is certainly one thing. What do we actually get as members of the council as well as the, the, the wider council? So look at, looking obviously at the, at the council's accounts, they are um, larger and more complex than the pension fund accounts, and we don't do wider scope on the pension funds. But in terms of the fee and, and, and what we deliver, um, for me there's that piece around the added value through the training. So we've had a number of conversations with Rona as monitoring officer around how we can support the committee going forward in its new role around the scrutiny and audit aspects and how we can provide training. There's also our relationship with council officers and how we share what happens across other local authorities, what we see working well, what we see not potentially working so well, as well as how we share with the breadth of the experience that effectively Grant Thornton has working across the public sector in the UK, so around whatever thought leadership publications we do. So, for example, we've shared most recently our social enterprise report, which looks at more income generation that local authorities down in England are doing, 
and different ways of operating services to help officers just think through in terms of the council transformation programmes as, as they're learning there. So we, we're very conscious of how, how we add value. Um, at the start of our appointment, we had that conversation effectively with the director of corporate services as well as the finance team. And that's something we'll continue to bring back to this committee through our plan around what, what would the committee like to see in terms of the value from us as your auditors. Thanks very much for that. I suppose we've got a, we, we, I should have said, actually, I should have said earlier, I missed it. But we have got a, an item of any other business. Uh, we all got an email about that. And we'll pick up at that point. We'll have a quick five minute recess at that point and it covers training and such like. So I think it is, if there's links there, all the better. So, Graeme Nicholl, Councillor Nicholl. Thank you, Chair. It's back to Karen's valuations. She said they were in a rolling programme of every five years. Now, explain that to me. I'll try and, um, does that mean that everything is valued on a five yearly basis? Or does it mean that everything is, some th assets are valued each year and they're all turned over every five years? Is that, can, is that question clear? Or, or? Yeah, so obviously like it would be impossible to va like value all our assets at one point in time. So basically a proportion of them are done every five years. So like there'll be like maybe 20% of them will be done this year and the further 20% will be done next year. However, if there was reason to believe that a property value had changed, it would be brought forward and done sooner. Thanks, thanks, Chair. I think Joanne's want to add to that, I think, Graham. Yeah, okay. Sorry, j just to add to that point, obviously, as part of the external audit, we pay particular attention to the valuation of the Council's assets. We flag that as a particular audit risk. Um, as part of that, we look at how the Council complies with the guidance around the five-year valuation programme, which, which the Council does. It's, it's common across all local authorities and in accordance with the Accounting Code of Practice. But as part of our audit, we also consider things like impairment indicators and whether there's any underlying issues around the actual valuations of the assets. And based on our work, we've no issues around the valuation of the assets that we would particularly wish to bring to your attention, if that helps in a context. I'm like Graham Bell here. I have serious concerns about some of the valuations that may be there um, because some of our assets are not worth an awful lot, to be quite honest. That would be my worry. Um, but anyway, we'll leave it at that. I suppose you said, before you come in, Graham, I just, I wondered, uh, certainly audit risk and scrutiny, we're picking up on that. And the, how does the wider council pick up on that particular? Is it through policy and resources? Uh, I don't know if I'm looking to you, Rona, for advice in regards to that, possibly. What I'm saying is that uh, the issue that Graham's picking up, well, the two Graham's arts are picking up, think, are we actually valuating our uh, properties or assets at the right level at the right time? Uh, where does that, there may well be a performance indicator around about that. Okay, yep. I'll just say, apologies, we were, my attention was just drawn to page 36. Uh, that in fact that uh, has been identified as a risk the way the way that the valuations uh, are are done and I just wondered if maybe through you chair if Karen wanted to comment on that. Yeah, so just thanks, thanks, Rona. <laughs> so yeah, that is where we have identified our risk and we've set out a number of areas just around the assurances we get around the valuer, um, the in-house valuer and the valuations and how those valuations are done and the qualifications of the valuer, which I think just confirms that we have taken the valuation of properties seriously from, from an audit perspective. I suppose from the council's perspective and the wider council, but if, if we were to bring Graham back in, where would we actually see that? Is that policy and resources? Would that come to there? Have we got a particular key performance indicator against that, that we're getting that right on time and the right valuation? Okay, well, just we can pick up on that. With you. Just, it's more clarity. Is that the case then we know as members to look out those, those certain policy, policy and resources or we can bring it up at a group level even that we, we know where to look for it? Or, or certainly we could, we could bring a, a report back to this committee just to explain how the valuations or done, if that would be helpful. Okay, yeah. we're getting not a lot of nods ahead, so yeah. make that as a note, we'll play, we'll pick yeah. that up in the recommendations, yes. rather than just a, an action. Okay, Graham, are you wanting back in still? Say, 
brother will chart account and father law as well, but looking at looking at obviously valuations in that, um, I'm farmer at my 900 cattle are valued at the 31st of March. My stock takings will take valuation combines and equipment. I have a, re a yearly valuation. The combines may be worth £140,000 uh, last year. It might be worth £120,000 this year. But I have valuations done on a yearly basis. My assets, my fixed assets are valued on a regular basis. Uh, my fertiliser and stock are all taken into account. It does concern me that the valuation of five years does risk to the council here because you've got plant and equipment from Dumfries and Galloway Council, maybe diggers and various equipment. The valuations of these machines are coming down. I know the number of vehicles are lease purchased or higher purchased than that. So there will be depreciation them. These need to be taken fully into account, a real and proper robust valuation. So I think there is risk here to council and the chairman is quite right, right along with Councillor Nicholson that it should be taken on board. Okay, we'll pick up that in the, as, as an action. Uh, no, as an action, as the, part of the re recommendation. Any other members got any points, questions? Wally, then back to Malcolm. Yeah, Chair, I'm moving uh, more to performance, uh, and uh, perhaps the, the report is light on that. I'm looking at page 15, uh, and I know this is talking about the, the accounting for Dumfries and Galloway and the IJB. And it uh, finishes there in, in, in the paragraph under that. The IGB has been consolidated into the Council's Group Financial Resources uh, as a joint venture, which is correct. What concerns me is the risk here in terms of governance and performance uh, of the, the, the IGB. And I heard Joan refer to the mission uh, uh, or the measuring of, of performance uh, and the delivery of service to the, the customers. And again, on uh, the following page, page 16, it refers to as the IGB consolidation being satisfactory. And uh, I look at page 20 of the report and it refers to the, the, the shaping reshaping of the council uh, service transformation uh, uh, and it concerns me uh, even more so when I read last week's uh, local paper, uh, the Free Press, and there were two reports in there in terms of uh, the mental health of people. The, uh, uh, and I'll come to the point, Chair, mental health I mean, I've actually picked it up later on in the paper, so I just want to add yeah. to what you're saying as well, will you? Well, that's good. It's the mental health, but it's the discharge from hospital. And I'm concerned that the finger of blame could be put back on the council on terms of its responsibility under care. And if there is not the proper care uh, at home for the person to be discharged, then the finger of blame could come back on the council, and yet there's no, uh, re or, or it's very light in terms of reference. And again, in the, the, the action plan, uh, at page 40, it does refer to risk management and performance measure, uh, aye, performance measures. My concern is to the performance, not only the performance, but the governance in terms of two cultures. I would describe as two alien cultures coming together, uh, where one has got openness and transparency, and the other may not, uh, in terms of how it's operated in the past, coming into that. But I'm not sure if audit and risk is picking up on that performance and whether the council is at risk of that finger of blame being pointed back at the council at some time. And the, the two articles in the local paper would indicate that to be the case. So there are issues for, for audit and risk, in my opinion, as a committee. There is the, 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 the IJB and how it reports, and whether we are picking up on many of the issues that are within that given that we, we, we've already given over a considerable amount of money, and I believe uh, mm. that it was once asked, then how do we follow that public pound as a council? Mm -hmm. Where is the risk in there, and is it being properly monitored? I did pick up on page 31 that 
that you've actually got. To, I will have described it. You've got a watchful eye on the IGB. Well, if you refer to page 31, so I think if I can just pick up on that point and let you answer, Joanne, in regards to that, the, the points that uh, Willie, Councillor Scobie, is bringing up. I mean, I think it is, there's, you hear it across, uh, we were at the Audit and Risk Committee of the IGB on Monday, Willie, but without getting into any, any of the detail of that particular co committee and what happened there, but I think I hear from members of the Council that are echoing some of the, some of the points that you're saying, it's, and it's cross, seems to be cross party, not just a, so there seems to be a, leg, a lot, of, a bit of, legitimacy around what you're saying so I think in regards to my, my point was actually if if, the audit, if if our auditors through Grant Thornton have actually picked up they, they're saying in my view they've got, they've got a watchful eye in the IGB, what, what they actually do they mean by that but obviously Willie's put his, posed his points as well, uh, Joanne So I, th so I think just, just picking up um, some of the earlier commentary in our report, so on page 15 and 16, is much more around the, count, the accounting for the IJB and the actual accounting and consolidation from an audit perspective, um, given this was a new development for this year. Um, we have set out on page 31 some very brief commentary around the IJB. Um, as the external auditor of the IJB, and I'm also the external auditor of NHS Dumfries and Galloway, I suppose, in a way, I'm in a unique position where I can see the IGB from, from both sides as well as an IGB. It isn't an ongoing relationship. It is something that's quite new for, for everybody in terms of you, you recognise the point culturally to the council and the NHS operate in slightly different ways. The financial arrangements are very different. But my perspective at the moment is that there is a genuine will for, for both parties to work together to make the IGB model work and deliver and improve performance outcomes in that area. It's, it's very new and the only reason I've flagged that is something we'll continue to look at is that it is a new and developing model. It's really only been the first year that the IGB has been fully operational and there's a number of changes proposed for 1718 around governance and performance reporting which as your external auditor, we will continue to pick up on. And I think looking forward, you'll see more commentary in the likes of these reports around the IGB and the Council's relationship with the IGB and the performance. But at the moment, it, it's, it's quite a high-level paragraph. Willie? Yeah, and I'm sure uh, Joanne, uh, Joan may be in a unique position uh, perhaps you know, got to look, you know how independent that is in terms of auditing the three bodies, uh, 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 and I see uh, Jane there uh, all aghast. I'm making the point that uh, it is a new body. We all uh, recognise that, but that's where you know things are cemented, and, and, and we've got to make sure that it's right in terms of the delivery to the people. Uh, the customers, the, the, the service users, uh, and to me, uh, I'll come back to the point that the finger of blame can be pointed back to the council, and we've got to get it right, uh, notwithstanding that it's a new year, uh, it, it, it's a, a new body in, in its infancy and, and so forth and so on, and I have serious concerns about the governance. Uh, and can, can the idea the of watchful eye, I think yeah. we've got to know where, what is the position uh, of the Audit and Risk Committee in terms of the, the performance, the, the, the scrutinising uh, uh, and the, the, the uh, audit. Uh, and Joanna did st start off by saying it's very much about accountancy with, and very light on performance. And, and I don't think that we should sit back and say, oh, well, because you're in your infancy, we don't, you know, and you refer to it as keeping a watchful eye. I think we need to do more than just keeping a watchful eye. No, so, I mean, I think uh, in regards to that, I think we'd ask, Joanne, that you do keep a watchful eye, that that has been raised at this committee. And I think impartiality is a valid point. I'll point the finger at myself as well in regards to that, Willie, because I'm chair of the Audit Risk Committee for the IGB. And it's, I think so, it's a, it's a fair point to actually bring up. And hopefully that'll be demonstrated as the years go, the year goes on, uh, that that level of impartiality is there, and as that does take its audit, audit and risk committee with IGB does take its role seriously. And this audit risk and scrutiny committee, again, it actually removes itself from any potential, uh, potential, I think, partnership arrangement it has through, through the, 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 the act, as it is a 2014 act. And we behave in a proper way that we do properly scrutinise the points that you're raising. That's why I had picked up on it myself, as, and you know yourself, I'm a, an IGB member. 
I don't think there's anything to add other than asking Joanne just to make sure that the points that have been raised, that again, we'd ask that you do as, as our external order to keep an eye on that. Thanks. So, yep, um, I've noted that point just in terms of um, continuing to review and look at the, the IGB and just um, a follow-up in terms of your point around impartiality. So my role as audit, an auditor is to be impartial, but I will continue to, to reflect on that. Malcolm, you did indicate come in. Yes, Chair. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm still I'm still a wee bit stuck in this pension scheme thing, unfortunately. Um, the, the implication was it was the the value of the assets that had the biggest effect on the the liability figure. But if you look at page one three six, which I think is note thirty three, uh, it's actually the value of the defined benefit obligation, which has uh, caused the big spike in the liability. How is the defined benefit obligation calculated? I, I maybe didn't get this a bit across there. The, the, the liability uh, is calculated by looking at the membership of the fund, looking at all the future uh, benefits that we paid out to those members when they're due to be paid, and then putting a net present value on that based on current government guilt yields, which is next to zero just now. So in effect, what that liability uh, calculation is saying is that in order to fund every benefit over the next 70, 60, 70 years, we need £1.2 billion. Pounds. The valuation which is done for the pension fund itself t looks at the same membership, the same benefits, but then says that the fund has £800 million of investments. They're not all invested in government gilts. We've got a wide range of assets there, equities, properties, etc. So the discount factor which is used to project the net present value of the liabilities is substantially different. So the liability figure for the pension fund itself is less it, because it's saying that to, to fund the, the liabilities going forward, we need maybe 900, 000, 900 million because we were generating uh, returns on those investments. So that, that's where the discrepancy arises between the liabilities. What's required for the council's accounts is the very prudent uh, basis, uh, liability calculation based on government guilts. And with interest rates being as early just now, it's more or less, it's about just above zero. So they're assuming that there'll be no investment returns on the investments over the next 50 or 60 years. So that's why the figures are a lot higher. They're saying you need more money now to cover that. I just, I just wonder, what, does early re what impact has early retirement and voluntary severance had on this particular issue, you could say, over the last few years? <sighs> the... Obviously, there's, there's an impact from early retirement due to the fact that you're having a reduced workforce. Uh, therefore, future contributions are reduced and also the benefits are paid earlier. Uh, in order to get around that, the, anybody who goes where there's, there's a strain on the fund payment which is made by all employers to the, to the pension fund, which is in, uh, it's determined in, in order to, to cover the additional cost of each member. So there'll be a charge there to say that while well, we're paying the benefits earlier, there'll also be a, an element of the, the strain in the fund payment to say we're losing out on two or three years contributions from that member. So anybody goes on ERBS, there is a charge to the employer which is made to the pension fund, but obviously it will impact on the valuation of the liabilities uh, the understanding is that the payments made by the employer goes into the asset pool and is invested to try and recoup some of those liabilities going forward. Thanks. That was my understanding. So there is an impact, but it's it's probably only one sided, and it's in regards to the, the then the I suppose the revenue consequence to the to the pension fund itself when it's paying out. 
Malcolm, have you got any other points you want to raise? Um, no, Chair. I'm quite, uh, it's the only reason I'm focusing on it, to be honest, is because it's such a large number. You know, that, that's, that's, that's the thing. That's the issue. Right, you see, it, it's the net present value, basically, of all benefits to all members of the pension fund, which should be due to be paid over the next 70 years. I mean, there will be people in the fund now coming in, 18, 19 year old, who will still be getting benefits say, in 70 years' time. It's not a case of saying everybody gets everything today. Oh, sorry, I thought it was on. Oh, thanks, Amy. I thought that was on. Sorry about that. Members, is it page 39? It is. What at risk? And that's done as a medium risk. My personal view would be that would be a high risk, actually, because it, it covers later on in the report, it says that, so we're meeting five times a year. That's what the Audit and Risk Committee used to do. Uh, now, we've got audit risk and scrutiny, and it's absolutely your evaluation. It's only a, a personal view I'm putting forward to try and emphasise, I think, what we, as an audit risk and scrutiny committee, the potential workload we've got in front of us, I think, and uh, is the council actually taking it seriously, the audit risk and in particular, I think, the scrutiny side when it comes to uh, the council's position? Is it? I don't know. By di it's diluted. It. It's the scrutiny committee, if I remember, it probably met someone in the region about 15 times last year, and the audit and risk probably five or six, whatever it was. If you combine them, you're t around 20 committees a year, and it says within the papers that, so we meet five times a year to cover the same level of delegation. But it does also say that uh, we're looking at that and we're taking it forward. Potentially, that'll change depending on, on what the committee think. How we take that forward. I did think that was higher risk because what you'd evaluated. I'd like to make that point. If you've got any comments in regards to that, and uh, I think they actually speak to the unions, believe it or not, in a, a report later on about this. Uh, I think they they felt pretty much the same by making it oppositional only, making it a smaller committee. Uh, they felt there was a risk in regards to not having a proper cross-party representation in the Joint Safety Committee. They, they would like to see a, a, a wider, but I think we're, we're stuck to what we are at the moment. That representation will be made from this, opposition only. Uh, but anyways, I just, to, to, just to try and I think that point had to be made, uh, Joanne, and hopefully we'll see that we'll see how that compares to this time next year, I think, or even get into June. Uh, so that was a point. You can, uh, so j just as a a uh, brief, brief follow-up to that. Um, it's not unusual for local authorities to look at audit and scrutiny and effectively look at how those two committees can come together in, into one. There, there seems to be a bit more of an increasing trend to look at that. Um, that said, across each of those local authorities, it's then how they approach that and how they adopt their agendas and the number of meetings or whether that's um, formal committee meetings like itself, supported by different working groups. And, and there are different models out there which we can help and help you look at and, and shape what you do. But putting the two together is not unusual. We we have flagged that um, being a 100% an opposition committee, that, that is unusual. I suppose from my perspective that I'm not saying that that's not going to work. I just think that is something that is unusual and something to work through when you look at the remit and, and, and your training and, and how you effectively fulfill the remit in practice. Um, I take on board your comment around the risk. I think for me as your external auditor, there's something about how this year through 1718, how the new structure beds in and looking at that once that year's passed and, and looking at the effectiveness of the arrangements and what's been learned. But I, I take on board your, your concern around the risk around that. Yeah, we've no, no other members. Oh, Jane, sorry. Sorry, I, I, have, I have lost it. I, I'm, I wrote uh, a, a circle around the issue um, relating to the failure to break even of the roads maintenance service. And I wonder if you could comment on that, because that's actually something that's been going on for some time. Um, uh, and um, if you could find it for me, because I've lost it, and I've been through these papers now. Where can I find it? Yeah, yeah. page 38. Thirty-eight, yep. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm aware that this has been going on for some time, and um, 
maybe um, we should think about well, looking at that because it has been ongoing for some time, Chairman. In the next report, what reports have been. So what Jane's saying is, we've got that any other uh, business, I think it's maybe appropriate that we actually look at that point then, when looking at agenda future reviews and agenda items, so I think that's quite appropriate. Then a really quick small, oh Malcolm, sorry. Thank you Chair, just uh, on the, the back of what Councillor Maitland said, I, are, there, are there any implications for uh, failing to break even in a rolling three year period, is there a uh, some statutory requirement there to do, and if we fail to meet it, what's the implication? So, so from, from, an, from an audit perspective, it, it doesn't result in a qualification within the accounts. It, it is an other matter in the opinion, um, but it doesn't mean your accounts are qualified. It is something that um, routinely features in other councils' opinions, just given the nature of the requirement to break even over a three-year period. Um, in terms of 1617, you had a small surplus, but in the previous two years to that, you had larger deficits. So to a certain extent, even if you returned quite a big surplus for next year, given the three-year cumulative, I think you will probably still struggle to, to break even next year. It'll probably be the year after that. Um, and there is and there is an action plan in, in place looking at that. And um, part, part of the challenge is just the, the accounting requirements that have to go through these STOs, which also don't help facilitate the break-even. I suppose I've said I've said this I've said this publicly. There's one more small small point. I don't know if you're aware of it, no. But on page 28, DG1, uh, I've made a note there just to remind myself that there was a release of confidential information in the public from uh, some members of the council on the back of the June meeting. Don't know if you're aware of that. If not, we'll pick up on it at a different time. I just wondered. Had you, were you aware of that and was that contained or not? If you weren't, we'll pick up at a different time. We'll come back to that. No, we'll take that as a no then, Joanne. Thanks very much. We'll move to the recommendations. Good find then. So, 2.1 on page 7 says to re receive the external uh, auditor's report for 1617 as appended. I think we received that and thank you very much for that, Joanne. Uh, 2.2 is to note that no issues have been identified in the course of the audit which have impacted on the fairness of the financial statements submitted for audited, uh, for audit, sorry, as detailed at paragraph 3.1. Will it? I'll maybe seek your guidance on this one and, and that other, uh, uh, Rona as well. Uh, while note that there are uh, no issues, uh, I think there is an issue and you refer to, referred to page 49. Uh, in terms of list of subsidi subsidiary undertakings, list of joint arrangements, and there are two big items. And it's that there is no item on the agenda to do today where I think I could hang my hat in terms of our own internal auditor, the amount of work. I think we do need to look at uh, IGB in terms of our working as a, an audit and scrutiny committee and whether indeed it's appropriate uh, on the point that you made, uh, whether it's uh, uh, adequate that we only meet five times, given the, the, the volume of, of business that could come forward. I just wonder, you know, uh, there's nothing there in the recommendations other than that part where I could hang that. Yeah, well, I mean, I, my thoughts in regards to that was to note that there's no issues, but we've identified, we could add to that, we've identified and uh, particular issues that we'd like to see being either reviewed or investigated, whatever it may be, at least considered it. And we'll get that as part of the minute. That'll be reflected, the points that are picked up, rather than including every single one, because there's quite a few. And uh, when we agree the minute last, uh, ne next time we meet, we'll be absolutely clear that that is there. And I think in our, our any other competent business, we'll pick up it at that point as well, in regards to looking at agenda items, future agenda items, and how we'll actually deal with that frequency and so on in training. If you're okay with that, will you? So if we can just amend that slightly, then I think, can we, unless you want to add something different to that, Rona, are your thoughts different? I mean, I think there's, there's a fair point being made that, you know, is lack of performance by the, AG, the IGB a risk for the council? You know, you are the Audit Risk and Scrutiny Committee. Uh, internal Audit also have some responsibilities for c council uh, for risk, and we have, you know, we have risk registers uh, in each department. So I think that we perhaps take that forward 
in that way and ask officers to consider uh, the risk registers that exist and whether that's one that should be owned. Taking that into consideration, you said we've, we've got something in black and white as well. So if 2.2, note that there's no issues being identified, but I think at the end of that, we need to put something in about uh, to recognise the points raised during this committee, and, that, and those points will be reflected within the minute. So if we missed anything, we can pick up in the minute, and then it's absolutely clear that any actions out with can we pick up another item, and any other comment of business if that's required. Have you got that clear? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks very much. 2.3 is to approve the letter of representation. Uh, to be certified by the Act Head of Finance Procurement and appended to the audit as per Appendix 2. We're okay for that? Yep. So we've approved that. 2.4 is uh, to approve the audited accounts, which will be certified by the Act Head of Finance and Procurement. And Grant Thornton at this meeting has detailed as per Appendix 3. And we're approving them. Yep. No descendants. Uh, and 2.5, just to note that the certified accounts and the summarised accounts will be made available to all members by the 31st October this year when they will be available on the Council's website as detailed as per paragraph 3.7 of this report. Okay, have you captured that? that report back. Yep, and I go on and uh, clear. Thank you, and you've agreed to, uh, for a report to come back to this committee to explain how the evaluation of the Council's assets are done. Yep. Thanks for reminding us that, yep, and that's true. So that's a 2.6. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. We've agreed that. Okay, number five. Is it? Okay, we've got Grant Thornton again. I think we'll just, if we can do this, follow the same uh, schedule, so to speak, as last time, same format. And uh, if you can set the scene, which I think is Rich, is it Rich? As you said, Joanne. Right, okay, Rich is your backup. Okay, so Joanne, over to you. Thank you. So th this one's our external audit annual report um, around the pension fund. Um, I just say it's also addressed to the controller of audit. So we submit this report to Audit Scotland. And once this becomes a final document, it's published on the Audit Scotland website. It's currently sitting as a draft, just in case there's any amendments coming out from discussion in this committee that we, we want to change. Um, I just flag, um, as set out on page 179 of your papers, we intend to sign an unqualified opinion on the pension fund, and Richard will just pick up some key points from the audit. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, I'll just give a kind of a brief overview, and I'm happy to take questions on the on some of the detail of the report. Um, the first thing I want to reference is on page uh, 181. Um, in terms of our audit approach, there were two two areas where we where we slightly updated our approach from the plan. Um, which we issued in, in February. Uh, in, in our audit plan, we identified the valuation of the funds level three investments. These are some of the most complex um, types of investments as a significant risk. Uh, but when we received the um, draft accounts, we agreed with the, um, with, with the pension fund that none of their, their, the, the, um, the fund didn't have a material um, holdings of these types of assets, so it wasn't actually a significant risk when we came to do our final accounts audit. And the other change was um, we, we updated our materiality level. Um, our materiality is based on the net assets of the fund, and as you'll have seen, there was significant growth in the net assets of the fund during the year, so we adjusted our materiality to reflect that when we received the draft accounts. Um, moving through the report, um, uh, starting on page 182, we uh, kind of lay out the risks that we identified and, and the work we carried out against each of these risks. And other than the change I referred to um, just, just now, um, our response to the risk was as, as, we, um, as we laid out in our plan. And um, we didn't identify any significant findings against any of these risks. And we carried out the work that we, um, that we said we would in the plan. Um, so I don't intend to go through that in any, any, any more detail at this stage. Um, just page 186, and we outlined that we also looked at the, um, some of the areas of the annual report, the management commentary, the annual governance statement, and the governance compliance statement. And again, we haven't identified any significant findings in relation, in relation to these areas. And again, on page 187, this highlights the work we've done around judgments and estimates, and there's no, no significant findings in these areas. Um, 
The last, the last part I just want to briefly touch on is in the appendix, appendix um, cited on page 193. Um, this just uh, clarifies that there were no uncorrected misstatements in the financial statements. Uh, there was one corrected misstatement, as you, as you can see there, of uh, £124,000, quite low value. And on page 194, we outline some minor disclosure changes which were made to the accounts following audit, um, and this was just to ensure the accounts were in line with um, accounting practices. Um, on page 195, you'll see we've identified a couple of recommendations which have been uh, agreed with management, and we're happy with the timescales in terms of these recommendations being implemented. And the final piece I just want to touch on is on page 196. Um, we followed up on the recommendations of the previous um, external auditor, and we're satisfied that all of these uh, recommendations from the prior year audit report have been uh, followed up and actioned by management. So that's all I was going to say, but obviously happy to take any, any questions on the detail. Thanks so much for that, Richard. And Joanne. So, any members got any particular questions in regards to item number five? We'll just go straight to rec recommendations then, if we haven't. But that may be the case. So 2.1 is to receive the external order support. As per Appendix 1, we've received that. 2.2 is to note that no issues have been identified in the course of the audit, which have impacted on the fairness of the financial statements submitted for audit as detailed at paragraph 3.1. It is okay with that. 2.3 is to approve the letter of representation as per Appendix 2. We've agreed with that. 2.4 is to approve the audit of the accounts and certified by the Acting Head of Finance Procurement and Grant Thornton, as per Appendix 3. Yep, we've approved that. And 2.5 is to note that the certified accounts will be made available for all members as per the previous report by the 31st October this year, as per the website. Item number 6. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay. Uh, do you want to say anything to this, Rona? I could just deal with this one fairly quick, I think. No, so the purpose of the report is to finalise the Council's rep representation of the Joint Safety Committee. We appointed three last time, there's six, I think. We're, so, like I say, so I think it's Ian, along with Matthew and myself. Uh, Wally's indicated that he wants to go on, so you're on the Joint Safety Committee now, Wally. We need two other members. Have we got any volunteers at this moment in time? We've got Malcolm. Uh, if Jane's not wanting it, we've got somebody to appoint, which is Councillor Karen Crothers. So that's the, the other three. We've got them, so that's uh, Councillor Scobie, Councillor Johnson, Councillor Crothers. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Item number seven, which is the internal audit reports. Kevin will be coming for them, I think, is he? You can come right up, Kevin. We're ready for you. Yep. We've dealt with item six. No bother. I think between you getting up from the members' lounge and getting through here, we've dealt with item six. So we'll try to expedite things. We've got a timeline to stick to, I think, without restricting debate, that is. So, Kevin, uh, we're asked to note and comment on the internal audits. I think these are, these are your uh, reports. I wonder if you could speak to both of them. Uh, you know, maybe up to five minutes on both, and then we'll we'll get questions after that, and possibly points. Thanks, Kevin. Over to you. Thank you, Chair. I have nothing to add to the report, so if you just want to go straight to questions. Okay, excellent. That's that's good. So you've got nothing to add in regards to what's there. I'm over to members now. Then, any members got any particular particular points in regards to these internal? It's before our time, or most of us, anyways. Most of us are new members on here. Jane. Um, Kevin, could I just ask on 4.3, could I just ask about sort of the, the wording of any commercial properties not created or deleted? Um, I'm not absolutely clear about what that actually means. If you could just give me a, a hand yeah. on that. Uh, yeah, the first one, the, um, the non-domestic rates, yeah. It, it was 4.3, um, and the, the wording says that um, this would, it's about a, a reconciliation between the assessor's database and the NDR system carried out by the revenue se section. This would identify any commercial properties not created, deleted at a rateable value, or rateable value change, miss, missed. Um, so is, is that is that basically 
How do we know that we've got everything on the list, if you see what I mean? Um, it's a good question, Chair, and that is uh, why we've put this paragraph in to explain how that assurance comes about. So, um, revenues keep a database themselves of all of the commercial properties. They are notified those through a number of sources, directly by people um, buying the property and moving into them, or land agents and these sorts of things. And as a double check, they reconcile that database to the assessor's database. The assessor is responsible for valuing properties and uh, setting the rateable value for them, and, and they are required, um, it, it is required that notification is given to the assessor of change of occupants and that sort of stuff. They also have people who go about and look at properties and they pick up quite a lot of information as well. So in effect, we have two databases which are separate and independent, and that's how we get the assurance that all of the properties that are due to be rated have been captured by the council. Thanks for that, Kevin. Anybody else? I suppose we'll, we'll take it in order. Jean's kicked that off, and we'll look at the main financial systems and non-domestic rates. Anybody got any other points in regards to that particular item? No, we'll, we'll just quick. Uh, Jean, you want another? Uh, you're welcome to. If, if that's all right. Um, and um, the, it's on the d number six, paragraph six. Does any further action need to take place? Um, management need to consider the issue of unsupported relief. Um, so what do we think is going to happen there? And uh, equally well, how do we know as a committee? I don't know what the system is, Chairman, for following up and making certain that things are followed through. Yes, Chair, it's a kind of uh, low-level problem, but nevertheless a persistent one. And as a result of other audit work we did, we, we assisted in the audit of the NDR return to the government, which is to do with the balancing of the pool and how much money we ultimately get, how much cash we actually get. We were picking up that through that audit that there were examples of where relief was being granted, particularly around charitable bodies, um, and that the support for that relief was either not on file because it was a paper copy that was some years old, or was not current. So we, we've been nagging at our colleagues to say, can you sort this out a bit, please? And um, they have attempted to reach out and contact all of these organizations in support of relief to ask them to confirm their continued eligibility for it. In some cases, the organizations have not replied, and that's because they may be very small organizations in connection, say, with a village hall or some small um, thing of that sort, and the administration on that's not terribly good. The, the dilemma facing um, Revenue's colleagues is they could cancel the relief, um, which will then issue a bill, which could be ignored for some time. So we have a whole sort of dance through this, and eventually it's very likely that the relief would be reinstated. And so there's an awful lot of sort of work involved in, in setting something up and then unpicking it. So we're sensitive to the fact that many of these organizations are poor at responding, but are almost certainly c continuing to be eligible. Nevertheless, as auditors, our advice is to try and establish a better basis, a more certain basis for the reliefs that are in operation at the moment. Um, we've had some success. Uh, we've had some, as a good example, there was one organization which had not responded to correspondence for a number of years. So we, we tracked them down, and it turned out the organization had, in fact, changed. It, they were still in eligibility for relief, but the organization itself had changed its format, um, and the administrator there was particularly poor at responding to correspondence. So, um, you know, the cases are persistent and they're individual and they take a fair amount of work to sort of bottom out. But say the overall requirement is for there to be good support for ongoing relief. And there'll come a point at which revenues will just need to bite the bullet and cancel the relief and issue bills for the full amount of the charge where they've had no comeback from the organization concerned. Could I suggest then, in order that, that Possibly, it might be something the elected members could help with. I mean, I, I bet in the wards, I bet we know what's, you know what's around and what isn't around and, and who's, who's in our wards and, and who should be receiving relief and who actually possibly has fallen off. I mean, if it's done on a ward basis, could it not be the question be asked, does anybody know about this particular organisation? Or is that not appropriate? I don't know whether that's appropriate. Maybe that's not appropriate. I mean, I, I was at a meeting last night, uh, Kevin, Jane, in regards to the whole committee, but it, the same people who are on the community council run the whole local 
village hall committees and it was business stream that came up, no doubt for business rates, they've still got, got the exemption because of the uh, unincorporated organisation, they'll have to pay rates, whereas if you're an incorporated organisation, you get, you get the, uh, the, the rates relief, or your, your water rates, that is, and your wastewater and, and drinking water relief on that. But I mean, when I read this, I thought the best way to flag it up is what you're actually doing. Personally, is it? You send a, a great big lump of a bill, so long as it can be backdated. And I thought that was the most important bit, because some of these bits were, some of these committees are meeting, or trusts, are meeting every three or six months. And that's the, the difficulty. And you've got somebody maybe pings an email or is a half copy, or they'll just pick it up under their normal working business. But certainly, no. I've had it raised with me before, but Jane, I think you, you bring up legitimate points, but Kevin, you have got to come back in there anyway. It was just to say, Chair, all avenues which would provide assistance to revenues, I'm sure would be appreciated. So I'll, I'll put the comment back to them that as part of this, if they're not you know, if they're not getting a response from an organisation and that um, the evidence is lacking uh, in terms of continuation of relief, then, then you know, uh, approaching the uh, ward members is, is a very good option. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Graham? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I totally agree with you, and it's what's called using local knowledge as opposed to official knowledge. Um, I'm looking at 4.38 down to 4.42, Kevin, and it's to do with debt written off. Um, and it states here that debt written off over £10,000 has to be authorised by the Head of Finance um, and Director of Communities, etc. It doesn't tell us how much debt was written off, and I was just wondering if that could be given to us, how much debt was written off and how many of them were over £10,000. Thank you, Chair. Yes, the, the, the little bit there is, in fact, um, it's a co-authorisation. So, so the, the, the rule is we, we reviewed um, the position about write-offs um, about 18 months ago, so I think, and under the new structure that was introduced was that, you know, for practical purposes, um, the Director of Communities, who is the responsible Director for Revenue Services, who provide the service, um, authorises the write-off, but for amounts over 10,000, there should be a co-authorisation and that was overlooked on this occasion, uh, which was unfortunate. There is a report done, again, as a result of this committee's intervention, reporting on debt write-off is more frequent now. It used to be an annual report that could stretch to two years. And this committee picked up that um, something had been overlooked in a write-off report. And as a result, by the time it was sorted out, the, you know, the debt was sort of coming up to three years old before it was being written off properly, sort of thing, as against to when uh, the, the practical um, occurrence happened. So as a result of that concern, there is much more frequent reporting and write-off. It goes to Policy and Resources Committee. Certainly I can, uh, for the member, I can identify the most recent report and email you the link to it. That will have the information on. Sums above £10,000 are specifically reported. There are some sensitivities around them. And another change that took place was that previously um, it, 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 there was a careful interpretation applied which was to say the debt had to be above £10,000. But in some cases, you'll have a debtor with multiple debts. And so what we've agreed is that uh, where the debtor, where the debts in total exceed £10,000 for a particular debtor, that will get reported as a specific de um, specific item. So £10,000 debts are reported, they're, they're named, if you like. There aren't terribly many each year, I'm pleased to say, but I can find the most recent report and um, email you the link. Come back to you. Um, are those heard in private or are they heard in open session? They are heard in open session. It's not a confidential item. That, hence, th there's an element of sensitivity about this, but it's still felt, you know, for writing off a large sum of money, which £10,000 is and above, um, th 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 there's been no pressure to, to report that as a confidential item. I'm sure there's, there, I've seen it in certain circumstances where it's taken, the public was excluded, but it was exceptional circumstance. Anybody else got any, any points in regards to that? Moving, moving on to the next report, which is in regards to payment cards for personal budgets. Anybody got any points in them? I enjoyed reading these reports, Kevin, because they're quick straight to the point. So, some of the figures, are, I, I, I would like mere figures, I should say, in regards to bring it into context, because I like numbers. It's something that I do like, I like to get to get through. But I think your format, as far as I'm concerned, is, is spot on, it's straight, it's concise, it's straight to the point. 
But I think as time evolves, I may well pick up on some of the movie. At a personal point of view, I, w I would like more stats in regards to just bring it into context, but that's a personal point. Uh, Kevin in particular. So we haven't got any, so we can say that we've uh, we've noted them. Oh, uh, Jane, sorry, go on. Um, I, I was slightly left with new. Uh, the management response to our report, they commented the audit paper is a fair reflection of what happens and where we are in relation to the control of monitoring direct payment spend. It doesn't actually say, yes, we're going to get into this and do something about it right now. So I wonder if I could possibly just have a little bit of help on this. Um, the, there have been quite a bit of problems. I, I've come across issues um, particularly do with um, the Spain um, issue um, and um, and I just wonder if we could in fact talk through this because I think this is going to be incredibly important as time goes on. I think the more and more people are going to be on this sort of system and I think we need to have a grip of it before it goes out to the locality. But... Chair, if I can, having said I wouldn't speak to the reports, if you can make a slightly broader comment. Um, Yes, this is this is a, an exciting and, and interesting development, and the introduction of payment cards has been very helpful to the council. Um, it, th there is a degree of administration associated with direct payments which is challenging for the council, and when you set it against the national guidance that's provided, which talks about light touch, you, you clearly get the message that from a finance or perhaps I shouldn't blame finance colleagues from an audit point of view. I might wish there to be quite strong controls here, quite high level of monitoring, very responsive um, to, to any sort of, um, I was going to say transgression, that's the wrong word, any, any stray from the rules. But the, with the client group we're dealing with doesn't allow that, and it's, it's just not appropriate for it. So in, in producing this report, we actually had a bit of an internal struggle ourselves um, in, in terms of saying we, we might perhaps have wanted to be clearer and firmer that you know, rules need to be very clearly defined and so on. Um, and we had very good representations from the service who pointed out the difficulties and some of the issues, and in particular, some of the challenges for some of the clients involved in this. And so at the end of the day, we, we have accepted that this, this has to be a light touch regime. There are certain things that, that you know, we feel need to be developed. Um, I, I'm not even saying need to be done better. I'm saying they need to be developed. It's something that is a progressive thing. And w w sitting within this, you know, uh, the sums of money are, are, can be very large. And again, against normal standards, this is something that, you know, we'd be very concerned about. But the cost of a care package for somebody, the cost of a care support package can be very expensive. And the requirement, and I think it's a fair requirement, and, uh, you know, if I was in the same situation, I can imagine myself having the same view which is that no, clients wish to be able to control and direct the support that they receive. And if we assess as a council that they lead a certain level of care and that that care will cost X, then, then you know, our responsibility is to provide that and to support them in directing that care themselves. So it doesn't lend itself to a very strong audit regime, unfortunately, um, or, or perhaps correctly, depending on your point of view. So we think it's, it's balanced, we think it's fair. Um, the administration of this will move to areas, localities, and again, th that perhaps offers better opportunity for a slightly quicker response. I mean, some difficulties around individual cases, financial difficulties, can be indicators of things. They can be indicators that the care package is not working properly or the person is struggling or whatever. So, so you know, we need to start with what the support requirement is, what the care package is. And the financial bit of it is important, but it's not the most important thing. Um, so the, the money is to facilitate appropriate care for people who've been assessed as needing it and who require it and who wish to direct that care themselves. So I think it will work. That's why we're not sort of raising a flag on this one and straight, you know, expressing grave concern about it. I think it's okay. So that perhaps explains why there isn't a sort of a, a robust plan of action within it. We've got some undertakings, you know, we've said a couple of things need to happen. We've had a commitment to deal with those um, undertakings and we're confident that will happen. We just need to let it progress. And I think, um, you know, I respect the people involved in this. I think this is quite challenging uh, to, to be able to deliver this particular service um, and, and effectively, but also to maintain the council's financial interests and ultimately the interests 
of the client and the ratepayers involved as well. Thank you, Chair. Well, it, it's really just to say that, I mean, for example, you've got the 4.29 issue, um, which is a couple of items which maybe weren't in the, uh, in the agreed um, outcomes. And, and if that goes on for any length of time, it becomes more and more difficult to deal with it. Um, and so I, I'm really concerned with, I agree, light touch, I do accept that. Um, but, but at the same stage, if, if nothing is done about it, then it kind of hangs over somebody who sort of knows probably they shouldn't have done that, and they have done it, and it hasn't been dealt with. You know, and, and I think that's as stressful for the client as having done it wrong in the first instance. Um, so I, I see in from five that you're talking about lack of resources, perceived lack of resources, has inhibited their ability to develop and utilize these opportunities to move to self-directed support. Um, so I wonder if um, we could maybe have just a comment or two um, about uh, from the, the service as to what is being done to, to deal with this. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, Kevin put it very eloquently and, and really did explain the, the difficulties we have with balancing self-directed support legislation, light touch, and the Council's sort of following the, 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 the pound. And it's a difficult balance to get. We, we are, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm not over-egging this, we are the envy of the rest of the Scotland for having the, the information that we have now. Prepaid cards has opened up almost something we didn't expect. You know, in the past, people would send in a return that would be four, five, six months down the line. Very hard to do anything about it. Now we have it, you know, on a daily basis. And, and whereas you talk about light touch, that brought in itself a kind of dilemma for us. What do we do with all this information? And quite quickly, we realised that one person doing this was not going to be able to develop it as fast as we could and to keep up, keep up to date. But we are making good progress. We, we, we've developed a locality model, which will give us uh, you know, people in localities working with a smaller caseload. They can be more reactive to it. So that's kind of addressing some of the resource challenges we had. The complexity of the cases and, and, and you know, the direction that we're taking now, and, and it's all about outcomes and not about hours, makes it very hard to, to understand. You know, you, you can look at the painter and decorator one, which is, is, is very much a no-no, but you could argue that making somebody's house look nicer, cheers them up, addresses their outcomes, helps their mental health. Trying to, to, to get that balance right is, is very difficult. And, and, and the, key bit, the key to all of this is, is, is getting someone's care plan correct. And, and, and give them the, the, the money to deliver that care plan. That stops them, the, the ability to spend money that, that we wouldn't see as being, being our responsibility. So, you know, the, the good news story behind this is that, you know, I think since, since February 16, we've suspended and clawed back over 1.064 million pounds in, in funds that we wouldn't have lost. We'd possibly have got some of that back in the past, but it just highlights that this, you know, fantastic development, which and, and other authorities are coming to look at what we're doing because they're they're excited at the opportunities that we've we've realised from it. So, you know, uh, uh, but it's sensitive to the person, so you have to deal with each one individually. And, and what's right for one person isn't always right for the other, so you have to take it take it in its merits. Thanks so much, and thanks for bringing it up. I was going to leave it alone, but. My own personal experience, and I'll just be very brief on this, I'm not actually looking for an answer, but 4.34 within on page 5 of this internal report, it refers to somebody actually having 43k sitting in, in their account. I think, well, that's a lot of care, maybe it was justified, but I came across a case in my own uh, life, you could say, that I think that's an individual with severe learning, or not no learning, se severe disabilities uh, of all different types, actually. Uh, I felt it was actually being used as a, as a cash cow, for the, another way of uh, describing it. I, think, I don't think I would want to describe it any, any other way. And I think if we've got systems in place now that identify this level and we can do something within two to three months, then it's the right procedure. I would not argue against this. And like I said, I, was, I don't know what to get into any level of detail in regards to that, but when I've seen that, that's the instant, instantly flashing in my mind. Uh, so no, I appreciate this report, like I say. So, Willie, and we'll finish.
Yeah, Chair, I mean, no totally agree with your last remark in terms of a cash cow, because some of these cases are complex and their needs are complex. But I think, you know, from the explanation given, then uh, I'm pleased that, you know, we're getting the, the, the resources to the people who require it, uh, as in when they require it, because I've also seen the other side that people get into uh, an anxious state when, when the monies uh, were not available, uh, and many of these people have other people to pay. And it's to that focus, and I don't know if that's a, a consideration in terms of what has been described here in, in the 4.3 paragraphs. Uh, uh, and just in terms of a recent judgment by an industrial tribunal under foster care, where the, 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 the council that the, or, or the, the applicant who took the counsel to court was found to be an employee under foster care and whether, you know, the proper advice has been given out to people who use SDS in terms of their responsibility and liability, uh, you know, and, and whether uh, taking that as the, an analogy whether well, there could be a case argued again that the uh, given foster care uh, in that case and the judgment there was then deemed to be an employee of the authority. Thanks, thanks. I mean, I think the, the bit that I picked up for, for your answer to Jane's question, I think the one point, you owed over a million pounds worth of money clawed back. That addresses a lot of the points that you're bringing up, Willie. That money can then be re reallocated and put towards the people that need the care as, as, as per the strategic and local plans of the integrated joint board. So, members are asked to note and comment on the internal audit reports finalised. I think we've done that. Can we, have we captured them within a the minute? We'll, we'll make sure we've captured them points clear within the minutes. Uh, number, item number eight is any other business. Do we have any other business? We'll take a three minute recess. We've got everybody's got a hard copy of the of the of the report. Is that right? So we'll just have a quick read, and we'll come back to it. Three minutes, and we'll just come back to that report. And what we're looking to to do in particular, I think, is pick up on training and uh, reviews, and so on and so forth. I haven't even got a soft copy. Somebody is doing a uh, paperless. So there's some in the the group room. Is that what you're saying? I don't know. We're getting some delivered anyways. Excellent. So, as part of the delegation, item, any other comment in business, just so I'll outline it, which is item 80, which is a delegation to the Audit, Risk and Scrutiny Committee. It's telling us here that the purpose of the report is to report, uh, is to report, provide information to members on the training and the planning frequency of workshops. This report is presented as an additional item of business, as I said earlier, due to the need for a decision prior to the next scheduled meeting of this committee, the members' workshop took place last week and issue, uh, issue papers were, were issued. So, 2.1 is to agree the, tra uh, the training that is planned and that is uh, that will take place on Monday afternoon. Just before we start on that, I'll get Rona just to quickly quickly uh, outline the, the kind of, almost like a flowchart, what we're kind of thinking in regards to the committee meetings, or frequencies, or workshops in between, and we'll just get through the recommendations and, and make the decisions. Rona, do you want to just kind of outline that? No. no I, mean, I thought the, the little session we had last week was, was very beneficial, and it, it enabled me to find out what training would be most beneficial. And you'll have noted in Grant Thornton's report that one of the actions against me this year is about elected member training. So that's me got one step uh, in there. And I think it's also useful to know what you know length of sessions that members wanted. So that that was clear guidance that you want shorter sessions, and you want them on a Monday afternoon. So that, that was good. In terms of the way that we discussed the scrutiny function should work, would be that a topic shouldn't take any more than three meetings to be started and, and finished. And I've picked up your concerns about perhaps not having enough meetings. Therefore, we considered informal workshop sessions would be a way of augmenting the, the scheduled meetings, but at the same time allow you in a more relaxed environment 
to ask the questions that you want to be asked, particularly if you're in witness sessions, uh, gathering evidence on those topics. So the suggestion is that we would have two workshops between each formal uh, meeting of, the, of this committee to try and, and move on that work. I don't know if there's anything else that you, you think we should add there. We've got the topics that were discussed as well in the report, but I'll leave that to members. I think when we get to 2.3, we're looking at the first topic, and I think the rest of the topics could possibly come up out with. So it's our first topic we come to. In regards, we've got a whole dose of them, uh, a, whole, uh, a whole raft, I should say, of uh, different different ideas what we should take forward as particular reviews. Graham, you're wanting to say something. Oh, Chair, just talking about the topics there in the 2.3, and that obviously the whole point stands as well up in the agenda anyway. Well, I think, I mean, I would suggest we've spoken about it a lot over the years, all different things, but I think a high line. Uh, certainly one, one for myself, I've put forward many occasions, is, is procurement in particular, and it looks at a whole raft of things in regards to procurement. And I think if we could, uh, I'll quite happily propose that we do actually go through procurement first as our first one, but then at our first workshop, we sit down and just actually go through uh, the, the, any other ones that we particularly think is, is, is appropriate, and then we'll maybe get a report back saying this is what we're looking at, and then prioritise them at that point. Now, Jane, I think I've seen it at the side of my eye, uh, and then Willie. Uh, well, I was going to suggest um, precisely the same thing. I think it seems to me that um, the whole issue of procurement, um, members would like to bottom out some of the issues that they've brought forward in the past, um, and it would be a good idea, I think, to look at how it's been working. I think the Scrutiny Committee did quite a lot of work beforehand, so we don't want to double up on that. We want to learn, use what they learned, and then see how it's actually working out now, because I think it's actually procurement in action that we are more interested in seeing um, and, and learning about. But can I say that um, at, at the workshops, we need to be completely clear about what it is that we're bringing. So um, I think there's no reason why members should not get their particular hobby horses dealt with, and uh, we'll, <laughs> and we'll um, uh, uh, bring those maybe to the workshop and, and get them out of the way. Officially prioritised after that. Willie? Chair, I wouldn't have thought it's about people's hobby horses. I think it's about the principles enshrined in some of these hobby horses. And Graham's referred to the, 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 the flood prevention, the, the, the sands and so forth. Equally, I could refer to the waterfront, mm -hmm. you know, where it's, you know, mm -hmm. two years of an exclusivity period mm -hmm. and we're still waiting on what the outcome of that two-year period was. It's that principle in terms of what we, as members, uh, where we are in terms of the risk to the council. And what actually, uh, not, not perhaps constitutes, but what are, you know, what are the risks? It's not just about finance. It, it, it's about other risks. The, rep, the reputation of the council in terms of if processes are not being uh, carried out, members are not being uh, fully uh, advised or, or information, that the, 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 the proper and fullest information given to members. Uh, and so there's a... Uh, plethora of issues which are reflected in an individual's hobby horse, but it's the principles enshrined therein. And I would hope that, you know, uh, workshops do not replace the, the, the responsibility of, of the audit committee that were using that when it should be decisions were taken, rather than covering something by a workshop, uh, uh, and you really don't have, uh, you, you can't take a decision because it's a workshop. Well, what we should be doing is meeting more as a, a, as a committee, either as a, a scrutiny and or a, an audit committee, to say we need to be taking things forward. I think, see, in the first term, we looked at that initially, and as it stands now, we've got five a year. And, and that's what it stands for in the short term, in a way to get round about that, Willie, or for it to supplement our ability, is what I've asked for this day. Because I sat in a review, that procurement review, I think it took us about two years with scrutiny committee, six months is what we're saying. So when it comes to decision making, but to supplement the, the three uh, committees that we do it from the scrutiny point of view, so we'll have three, we'll have a start, we'll scope out the work we're wanting to, look, wanting to look at. Two committees in between that, two, sorry, two uh, workshops in between that will get right down to the, in an informal basis, in a private basis, so we can actually air our views absolutely clear what we want to see, do we, what witnesses do we want to draw in, what information do we need. So that over two sessions between that in the next two months, we'll pick up on that level. Then that'll get reported to another committee, saying uh, updating us on the progress where we're getting. Then we'll have another two workshops in between that and the next one. We'll get to the next committee, 
that is a reference to full council. We we'll say, okay, this is we've started here. We've had we've done this investigation, this review, and so on and so forth. In between, six months later, we say, this is our recommendation to full council and our review. Like I say, taking it back to the previous when it was two committees, nearly two years. I, I went to five. I think it was five. Uh, different local authorities across Scotland looking at procurement and so on and so forth and I felt when it got to the recommendation to go to full council it was, it was weakened to say that or watered down to say the least and I don't expect that to be the case here we're all certainly opposition members there's no affiliation whatsoever to the administration so I imagine to be a quite a strong and robust discussions as we go forward so at 2.1 can we agree that the training is planned for to take place on Monday afternoons does that suit so as as a so most of us are here on Monday 2.2 Agree the frequency of this, the scrutiny workshops, which has been outlined, I think, as in uh, two in between each committee, based on uh, bi-monthly meetings at this moment in time, uh, predominantly. And I agree the first topic, can we ask that it's uh, procurement, and will any other topics that will be brought up maybe as a, uh, an agenda item of the first workshop? Excellent. Graham. Yeah, just to flag up that Grant Thornton did flag up in the report that uh, attendance at the training was not particularly good and it should be emphasised that it is essential or, or, I mean, everybody can't attend every meeting, I appreciate that, but as many people should be encouraged to come as, as possible. Well, just as a group position, I did pick up, I thought I'd put that back to the group as a group position. Malcolm? Yeah, thanks, Chair. As far as the training is concerned, if it's... Uh if it's kept short and it suits uh, suits timings for people, which unfortunately I tend to think it will not suit everybody, which is, I think, why at our meeting last week I did ask if there was any possibility of any sort of online training or even if there was slides that could be sent out, a PowerPoint thing or anything just to work through would be helpful. Yeah. <coughs> I don't know how long these things take to develop, but certainly the, the idea online, we have those flow courses now, you've probably done some of them yourself. We can certainly try and convert some of the learning from the more formal sessions that will be provided by Grant Thornton and feed them back, or we can arrange to do it informally with you on a day that you are in and just give you the, the, the basics to take away and discuss. So we'll, we'll that's that's us and really for me that if you've captured that clear. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much everybody for the attendance.